Finding one's own voice in photography isn't just about technique or style. Technique and style are easily duplicated, resulting in countless photographers who seem to produce the same kind of work as others. You don't have to look any further than Instagram for proof of that. However, there are photographers whose uniqueness comes from how they both see and experience the world. When they embrace that personal and genuine approach, they create bodies of work unlike most others. Dwayne Michaels is one such photographer who for decades has created work that challenges ideas of what photography can and should be. His early work moved beyond the singular image and became the product of a visual poet and a storyteller. His examinations of mortality and sexuality have been born not from what he thinks about, but how he thinks about them. As you'll hear, Dwayne Michaels is a unique voice, whether you're looking at his photographs or hearing him speak. This is Ibadi and X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. So, Dwayne, welcome to The Candid Frame. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to have you. I love being had. <laughs> I've been a long admirer of your work, but you probably hear that a lot. Nevertheless, it's, it's true. Well, thank you. One of the things that struck me as very interesting about uh, your work is I heard you say once that much of your work is sort of inspired either by what makes you afraid or what makes you angry. And it, was that something that you were sort of aware of from your early days as uh, making making photographs, did that, that come later as you started developing your practice? No, no. <laughs> you sound like a doctor developing my practice. <laughs> yeah. Take two aspirins and call me in the morning. No, it's uh, I'm not a typical photographer, as you might have guessed. And mm -hmm. so my energy and my sources and my comes from sort of everything in my head. I'm more cerebral. I'm more brain-oriented, mind-oriented, and eye-oriented. You know, those photography books are always the eyes of Laura Mars and looking at pictures about, no, but uh, it's not about that. It's about, uh, I'm interested in what something feels like more than what it looks like. Yeah. So if I see a woman crying, you know, I want to know why is she crying? What does grief feel like? You know? Yeah. And that's, that's, I think, a struggle for a lot of photographers to make that leap from what things look like, from yeah. simply being a glorified Xerox machine into creating images in which they can express something. But how, how did you come to start to learn how to express feeling and emotion in a well, photograph? I was never a traditional photographer. I never went to photo school. I became a photographer quite by accident by going to Russia when I was 26 and I borrowed a camera. But the trip literally changed my life. So I suppose when you go to photo school, they have to teach you photo rules mm -hmm. and unlearning is much more difficult than learning. And the things that interested me, you know, I didn't want to be a mini Bresson or mini Robert Frank, who I love enormously, and certainly not a mini Gary Winogrand, yuck. But I, I'm very opinionated, I should warn you. <laughs> okay. I use the whole package. I use everything. I, I use not just my eyes. I'm, I'm not Ansel Adams, so why should my photographs look like his? So as long as you're wedded to doing consensus reality, the thing we all agree on, and you keep looking for life out there to be examined without realizing you are the event. Yeah. We are the event. And photographing people who I know nothing about, the only truth I know is my own truth. I'm an empiricist. I believe that direct experience is true knowledge. It's a difference between reading 100 love stories and falling in love. They're two different experiences. Yeah. And photographers are always photographing other people's love stories. And the one thing they know something about, it's not an option. I've heard you say uh, several times that Russia was a transformative moment for you. Could you explain what it was about that trip that made such an impact? Well, first of all, it was an adventure. When I was 15, I read in the McKeesport Daily News that if you went to Texas, you could work on the wheat crop. Jimmy Connolly and I took a bus. My mother and father gave me a one-way ticket, <laughs> which, I, which I should have figured out what they were trying to say. It was a disaster, but it was a great disaster. And then I went to school in Colorado rather than going to school in Pittsburgh, where I was. So going to Russia was very much the sort of thing I would do. Out of, I think the difference is curiosity. I always tell students that if you leave this school asking fewer questions than when you got here, you didn't get an education. And it's a curiosity mm. of not what something looks like, 
It's very easy to go to a strange culture and photograph people with tattoos all over their forehead. It gives you a picture. That's all observation. Mm -hmm. Work becomes important when you transcend observation and bring insight into the observation. For most people, it's just observation. Oh, I invented a new word. Uh, You know how we have different categories, reportage and uh and portraiture and blah, 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 document, blah, blah. Well, my new category is Foet. Now, a foet Foet. is a photographer who does poetic Mm -hmm. photographs, P-H-O-E-T. And that would include Ralph Eugene Meatyard and Jerry Mm Yulsman. People don't have a label. And so I'm a foet. But I know it. <laughs> I'll say anything. But I think it's funny. Really, I think. Well, good. Are- we, especially now, we need as much humor as we can get. Absolutely, totally. Yes. Actually, I'm I'm 88. I'm really glad I'm old. You know, this I get out of here before the shit really hits the fan. Ask me a hard one. Well, I don't know how hard this is going to be because uh, you've been interviewed so much. So, but uh, one of the things that's really interesting about you know, your, your, your series of images is that you moved away from just doing the singular image yeah. and you're known for that. But I'm, I'm curious to understand what was the catalyst for yeah. it? Was it yeah. a, a happy accident or no. were you inspired by some, uh, someone else's work and that led you to explore that? No, 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 no. It was a happy ending. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't see the, the single image as being it. I thought, well, if you take one picture, why don't we take the moment before the decisive and the moment after? And that gave me a little wiggle room. Since Mm -hmm. I was the author of the idea, well, then now I had, you know, I could have a guy enter a room and then fall on his face rather than just falling on his face. So it it freed me from the stillness of the still photo, just like writing freed me from the silence of the still picture. And it freed me from the tyranny of the decisive moment. That was the only game in town. And I thought, why? Who wrote the book of love? You know, who wrote that? I, I, yeah. yeah. And because I didn't grow up learning all that stuff, I thought, why not? That's the secret creativity. Why not? Why not? Yeah, just because you didn't see someone else doing it didn't mean that you that's can't the, do it. That's the best reason not to do it. I told you, I'm not Ansel Adams, so why should my work look like his? It's a very tight little ship, the, the photo world. And it was like Hollywood, you know, in the 30s where you had four major studios and you had Louis B. Mayer. Well, you had Zarkowski and four categories, reportage, the same four categories, you know. I was lucky that I didn't come up through the photo ranks. I always thought outside of the box. When you were coming up with these, you know, coming up with these concepts and these ideas, did they immediately lead into sort of, you know, the mechanics of putting it all together? Or are you a sort of person who like writes, writes a, um, not a diary, but a, a storyboard? Sto- not a storyboard, but do you sort of write your sort of ideas on paper and you have any myriad of ideas on no, page? No, no. I'm not, I love Woody Allen, and he showed how he had all these pieces of paper with ideas on them. I don't work like that. I focus entirely on one thing. So the first ones were very simple. It was like I did one called A Woman's Frightened by a Door. Mm-hmm. It's a naked woman sitting in a chair, I mean, a sofa, and on the right of the frame is a door. And I had to find a door that when it opened into the room, you couldn't see who was coming in. So she's sitting there, naked, vulnerable, erotic, and she's reading a book. And very slowly, the door begins to open in like five pictures or whatever it was. But she never sees who's coming in. And little by little, she becomes more alarmed as the door opens very slowly. And then she panics, and as the door is almost wide open, she jumps up and drops the book or whatever happened. So that was wonderful. They were like early Charlie Chapman movies. Garbo Speaks. I was free. Everything freed me to do anything what the fuck I wanted to do. I was completely free. And when you buy into rules of the game, which photography was all about, you you buy their rules. And then when I wrote with Photograph, you know, I could show you a picture of a woman, I could show you a picture of my mother and my father, and the two of them are standing next to each other, smiling. They didn't even like each other. They hadn't done in about 40 years. They barely spoke. And yet the picture is smiling, portrait faces, lies, lies, lies. So then to get around it, I had to write. 
But there's a tradition of writing. It's no big deal. Photographs always have writing on them. That's a caption. The caption tells you what you're looking at. What I do is tell you what you can't see. It's very liberating. Do you feel like that the way you choose to make these images, either in series or the inclusion of writing, mm-hmm. is a more honest expression than a singular, singular image would be? No, I can't say. Well, it's more honest in this sense that I talk what I'm, I know what I'm talking about. If I photograph somebody getting hit by a car, you know, so what do I know about that? It hurts probably, but I know anything about it. But if mm-hmm. I talk about being gay and those issues, I know what I'm talking about. You know, so there's no bullshit in what I do. The other is full of bullshit, the pretensions that, oh, you captured this. Oh, that's nonsense. Get over it. Captured my ass. <laughs> now, there's a thought. That's the thought of the day. <laughs> so it's interesting when I see you, when I see you making portraits, how did you sort of translate that trans, uh, sensibility when it came to, you it's know, making sensibility? Yeah. It's, yeah each, each thing demands different things. First of all, I invented categories. I have a category called stand and stare. Stand and stare is what Diane Arbus does, Nadar did, Olga Sander did, Richard Avedon did, Penn did sit and stare. But there are people standing and looking at their passport pictures, you know. Those are descriptions. I knew, you know, I mean, I, I knew any number my entire lifetime. I knew nothing about them. You know, what do I, we know roles. We know the role my mother, back to them, the role mm-hmm. my mother and father played in my life. Does that mean I know? I didn't know what Margaret was thinking when she married him, and I don't know what he was thinking when he married her. You know, what were they going? I don't know anything about anything. I'm an empiricist. The only, I said this before. The only true knowledge is direct experience. You know, the, the guy says to the woman, I love you, and she thinks they're going to get married, and he thinks he's going to get laid. Language is completely erroneous. So anybody who claims they captured anything, I have a random body. This is a 1932 random body, and it's a 88-year-old model. I'm an old 88. They're recalling this year. You can get spare parts for this year. It's a random body. You know, people don't question anything. They just buy the whole package. We're all prepackaged by the culture, by religion, all nonsense. I don't care what you think. I, you know, do what you want to do. So what are the other three uh, types, uh, architects of okay. uh, portraits? Well, there, there's standard stare. And then there's something I call the, uh, it's in my book, read my book. It's, <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> soon to be a motion major disaster. No, it's, the, the other one is called the annotated portrait. Now, that's when I took a picture of my mother, yet again, father and brother, and I wrote under it. So that's what they look like. And then I, the text I said was very liberating. It said... As long as I can remember, my father was said he would write me a letter when I left home, but he never said the letter, w- what it would be about. So I wondered what secret the last the two of us would share, what mystery. But I know I'd hoped in reading a letter. I wanted him to tell me where he had his and hidden his affection. But the never, letter never came, and I never found that place where he had hidden his love. So I'm annotating. I'm showing this is what they look like. When I was 21 years old in New York in my apartment and they were 41 or 50, Mm. that's a fact. That's the facts. But what I'm telling you about what did or did not happen between. So suddenly I upped the ante. So the thing is that now I showed you what they look like and now I told you my version of what it was like to be with them. And then I did something which I called the, let's see, I forgot what I called it. But I did a portrait of, you know, Michael Richard Kramer. Mm-hmm. And it's sequential portrait. And he's sitting there and he's reading a book and there's a bottle of milk on the table and there's a glass. And while he reads the book, he pours the milk, but he misses the glass and the milk goes all over the, fl- all over the table. So that's a shtick. Michael Richard did shtick. That's what they do. They do jokes. So I did him in a manner of what he does. I did Michael Richards doing a joke. Mm. I could take a picture of him looking in the camera, staring at me. You know, bullshit. It's bullshit. But to do, like when I photographed Magritte, I knew his work so well that I could do his portrait in the manner of what Magritte's work was about. I did double exposures. I have in front of an easel. You could see through him. So I prefer if to do a portrait, which is very difficult. Most times you can't do it. But it expresses something, not just what they look like, but it tells you what they're about. 
Michael Kramer did shtick. I uh, did the same thing with uh, Robin Williams, who was amazing. Mm -hmm. But I don't claim to capture anything. And people are so in love with celebrity. Blah, 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 blah. Get over it. What well, celebrity is the cheapest thing? Well, Andy Warhol's the tackiest person in the world. And, you know, he made a whole career becoming famous. You know, fame is not a, a destination. Fame is hollow. It means nothing. What is fame? It means everybody knows your name. That doesn't mean you're, and, you know, everybody knows Hitler's name too. Fame means nothing. Did you write that? I didn't see you write that. You're going to forget. Oh, this is being recorded, so. You're being, oh, oh now you tell me. Oh. <laughs> oh, my mother and dad are dead. They'll never hear it. Okay, ask me another hard one. The, the, it's been interesting to hear you, you, you talk a lot in terms of spiritual matter, matters. And yeah. when did you come to begin to incorporate or have a greater understanding of spirituality beyond sort of Western traditions, because oh, you know, yeah. I hear things of Buddhism and and, yeah. and a of lot course. of things. When yeah. did that come into play for you? Uh, when I was a Catholic, unlearning. Cause you spend your whole life unlearning. That's why I say, being a photographer, you go to photo school. You have to unlearn photography. You don't want to know about it. You want to become a photographer, take pictures. Okay, forget it. Well, you know. I have an enormous curiosity. It's all about curiosity, number one, not what something looks like, but what, what does it feel like? Number two, I'm gonna die, D-I-E, dead. No breathing, eyes closed, liquids oozing out of every orifice. Now there's a picture, take that picture. <laughs> I'll pass I on that. I did my self-portrait as if I was dead in 19, I don't know, early. My self-portrait as if I was dead. I'm looking at myself dead. Uh, I did my self-portrait with my guardian angel. But the thing is, it's curiosity. The first book I bought when I was 17 with my own money after I got out of high school was Evelyn Underhill's book. It was called Mysticism. I thought, what the hell's that? So then I began to read it. Then, you know, I began to meditate. Now I do Kundalini, you know. You're as rich and deep as you want to be. If you want to be a product, another product of the culture, then enjoy your life, okay? Another product purchaser another hackney but i'm curious about everything my second book was called the journey of spirit after death who doesn't want to know what's going to happen when you die that is, is mind everything you know i'm three four five dimensions most people are two dimensions consumer horny let's you get your consumer you get your horny and sex sales let's see and, and then you get your disappointment why is life happening to everybody else but me it's you it's your fault want something go get it <laughs> So when you were I'm creating, you, it's okay. I, I was I, I was warned ahead of time, so I, I'm thinking, there's no surprises here. Okay. Your early work was about exploring exploring death, and that was a lot of those happened about 40 years ago when you were doing those those early images. And I'm wondering, you know, 40 years hence, are you still sort of exploring those themes yes. in your in your work, and and how so, and how are they different now? Well, I'll tell you, my first book. And the sequence book, which changed my life, I had Spirit Leaves the Body, where the guide gets it. Death Comes the Old Lady, where my grandmother uh, dies when death puts us and she blows up into her particles. In the very first work, I was talking about this subject. Now, f most photographers, the observers of life, they go to a cemetery and photograph tombstones. They photograph ladies in black crying. They photograph corpses in, in, in caskets. Those are the facts of death. I don't want to know the facts. What, 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 what's the metaphysical implications? And discount, the, I'm an atheist, discount Mr. God, discount heaven and hell. Religions are political institutions designed to perpetuate themselves. That's what they're all about. And they sell you heaven and hell with a, on a long stick, you know, and, uh, you know, that's what they keep you. You're going to go to hell. Ooh, 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 you're going to go to hell. Ooh, heaven. Hmm, heaven, nice. No. No, come on. Ask questions. Photographs should ask questions, not describe. Do you feel like you get answers as a result no. of the work that you put in there? No. These are questions. I did a book called Questions with, Without Answers where I ask questions, you know, and I try to answer them. So my photographs, again, I keep going, are not about descriptions, something that happened at a particular time and place. And I write about everything that comes in my head. Time is such a funny thing. It's like a hole inside a ring. It's always now and never then. But when I say it's now again, it's always then and never now. I'm always here and never there. But when I go from here to there, then there is here and here is there. And if you think you're very tall besides a tree, you're not at all. And if you think you're very small besides a bee, you're 10 feet tall. 
When we dream, we seem awake, but all along the dream was fake. You say you're I and also me. I know that's true. How can that be since I'm not you and you're not me? Time is not what you might think. It is and isn't in a wink. And don't show me a picture of a clock, please. That's not time. That's that's recording time. With the book that you said, Sequences, your, your first book. Yeah. Tell me how that came to, to be. It was amazing. I had to trifecta. There I was doing these sequences. The first show I had at the Underground Gallery, I always tell the story how Gary, Gary Winogrand came and walked out, and he said to me, what is this? It's not <laughs> photography. It's not your photography, asshole. I didn't say asshole part. I didn't know that yet. But then I had a sp- I, and there was a, the best photo magazine in the world at that time was Swiss Camera. And I had a friend going to Zurich. And I said, well, take these pictures, show them. And they gave me, I don't know, practically a whole issue on sequences. And then Zarkowski saw, but it was actually Peter Bunnell. I, I got, oh, and then Doubleday called up and said, we want to do a photo book. Would you like to do it? So I got a book by Doubleday, a spread in sequence in and then I got a one-man show at MoMA, but a bump. Yeah. And that's hitting the trifecta. Well, you talked about, had your commentary about fame before. So how did this sudden recognition that you had about your work that you were doing for very personal reasons, what was that experience like where all of a sudden people started recognizing you and well, your it work? Was, it wasn't that immediate. And I thought, well, isn't that curious? You know, there, what's his name wants to do an interview in modern, uh, what's his name? Julia Scully did a piece in modern photography. Wow, look at that. You know, I did, it, it, photography wasn't then as it is today. It was a very small world. And it was, I told you it was Hollywood with four studios. And it was, uh, Zarkowski's was, ran the ship, you know, mm-hmm. and the four P, and if you didn't fit into that, but he had to deal with me cause I was there, but I was always like the token weird ball, you know, outside of, <laughs> They wrote in when one one of those modern, and they said they included me, but then they said, but you know, he's not really not a photographer. I mean, he uses, but he's not. A well, so what? I know I'm not a photographer. I don't know what I am. I'm, it's me to say what I am. I didn't want to be defined by Zarkowski's rules. And if you let somebody else define you, as I keep telling you, you you deserve it. Well, that's one of the things about, you know, when you find a unique voice in your photography, suddenly people expect you to just keep doing that forever. No, I know. And you, okay. sort of, and you certainly have broken, broken no. that expectation numerous times. Yeah, I keep evolving. And when I began to write with photographs, I remember I ran into Sid Kaplan, who used to be the printer for, I, I worked with him only because he was the printer for Robert Frank. Robert Frank, my God. Zeus, Frank, I would call him. And so I ran into Sid. He said, at, he was teaching at School of Visual Art. He said, you know, the scuttlebutt at school is that your photographs are so awful. You have to write out and to describe what they're looking at. <laughs> he said, what should I tell the students? I said, tell them in five years, they're all going to be writing under photographs. How's that for chutzpah? <laughs> what do I care? I'll keep it short this week. I love doing this show and have for the past 14 years. Having an excuse to have these conversations and sharing them with you is incredibly satisfying and inspiring. But as with anything worthwhile, it requires both time and money. Your contributions help to meet the monthly cost of production as well as provide me the free hours I need to spend on scheduling and researching each guest and conducting these interviews. Your contributions mean I don't have to spend that valuable time trying to secure a freelance writing gig to supplement my income. It takes me just as much time to research and write an article as it does for me to prepare for each episode. So your support makes a big difference. So please, become a Patreon supporter today. You can contribute $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame. These modest amounts add up and provide us the means to keep the show growing and thriving. So, if you appreciate the work we're doing, please come on as a Patreon supporter today. Thank you. (laughs) 
So when you, let's talk about that. When you would sit down there and you would have the print that you you, you created it, the writing, how, how did that manifest itself? Did you try a variety of different texts no. on, on variety of prints? No. Or did you just kind of like? No. I, I always like, I'm a big reader. In high school, I was a news editor of the school paper. Yeah. And my year, we won the best prize for the best high school edited newspaper. Aha, think of that. So uh, I... I like to write. I like to read. I don't, but I'm not, I don't write literature. I do C. C Dick, C. Jane writing, you know, mm -hmm. C. Spark, you know, C. Spot, C. Spot Run. That's, I, I write very simple writing, but I love writers. I just sent out a thing with my six great influences. One was James Joyce. I did a little movie about James Joyce. The other one is Rambo, Arthur Rambo, the famous French poet. The other one was De Chirico, the painter. No photographers. The other one was Balthus, and the other one was Magritte, of course. So none of my sources are in photography, although I love Ache, and I truly love uh, Robert Frank. He's my hero. How so? He's the best. He's, he's, a, he's a foet. He's a reportage foet, and so is, uh, what's his name? Bresson's a foet. Mm -hmm. Gary Winogrand's a hack, and let's see, there are a lot of hacks out there. And do you feel like you get that feeling from taking a look at Brassans and no, no, I get, I get, Franks or? I'm touched by what they do. See, mm. what a really original person does, they show you something. Oh, it's like this. I admire aerialists, acrobats, because I can't do that. And I admire the, the intimacy of the design at the height. You can't get any better than that. They define the field. And then you get all that wannabes like Winogrand, all the wannabes uh, but uh, and it, it spills over to uh, color photographer all those pictures of backyards in upstate New York you know ho-hum mm -hmm. all observations with no insight I know what backyard don't show me what I already know I know what tits look like I know what snow looks like I know what cars look like show me what I don't know and they always show what I know is that one of the reasons why you leaned away from color, at least with that initial work? No, I always did color. I, I did. No, I, you know, I did. I had a very successful commercial career. I'm very mm -hmm. proud of my commercial work. There are a few photographers, myself, Bruce Davidson, Meyerowitz, Joel Meyerowitz. We all did commercial work. You would, you would be totally amazed. That, here's my favorite story. Once when I started out doing commercial work, this young girl came up to me on where I was working. She said, are you doing my, I said, yeah. She said, well, what are you doing here? I said, I'm making a living. And then she said to me, seriously, oh, I would never sell out. And I said, honey, you have nothing to sell. Believe me, all these people don't want to sell out. But you can't give it away. It is much harder to be a successful commercial photographer. But there are those commercial photographers who never had a museum show. And there's the museum photographers who couldn't stand for a minute doing a commercial job. I've worked both sides of the street. I'm just very proud. I've done lice, life, lice, life covers. So that's funny, lice covers. I've done uh, everything, uh, campaigns for major people. I did the Synchronicity album for the police. For the police, yeah, album. Yeah, yeah. I did a lot awesome. of them. It, it, I had a great time. I love doing what I've never done before. I don't like my comfort zone. I get very uncomfortable doing the same thing over and over. And most people are afraid to try something new. I'm still doing something I've never done. It's a principle, doing what I've never done before. You, you started painting, I think, in the, in the 70s. And yeah. in, the, in, the, in the more recent work, I've seen that you've incorporated a lot more painting. So how is yeah. that? Tell me about that in terms of something you didn't know how to do before and well, how well, that's yeah. created a different facet for you. Oh, I used to, when I was in high school, I used to draw, I used to win prizes and paint. And I, I always felt, and I'm never satisfied with this, people categorize you. They say, oh, you're a photographer, you're a painter, whatever. but there's a space between photography and painting. And mostly people would use martial colors. They would tint, there was tinning. And I thought, well, why? So then I began to I have a small ability to paint, so I began to draw on top of the photograph. So it became a whole category. And Hilton Kramer really shot me down. I had a big show with Sidney Janis, and he said I couldn't draw. I could draw better than uh, like Cy Twombly or people mm -hmm. who throw painted canvas. You know, I know I can draw, and I admire 
drawing. I love drawing. I think you should exercise any talent. If you think you could, say you think, you know, I'm, I really fart very well. Maybe I'll do a <laughs> fart show. Yeah, why not? Fart show? Are you crazy? I said, another five year old, you're all going to be farting. <laughs> <laughs> I always amuse myself, not as much as when I was a younger man. Let me put that on the table, too. You didn't get that, did you? I, I got enough All of right. it. Oh, you don't want it, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting what you just said. You felt like you that that you knew enough about how to draw and how to, how to paint to give yourself permission to do it. And I think a lot of people sort of keep themselves from doing it because they don't feel they do it well. Oh, see, that's it. You said something... Give myself permission. Who cares what I do? Who is there looking over my shoulder saying, tish, 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 no, no, that you can't do that. Well, who, why, who are you? You know, people do think they inhibit themselves. You have to understand nobody cares what you do. You have to care enough. And if you don't care enough, then don't complain when somebody else does it. I don't need anybody's permission. The only permission you have to worry about is somebody who pays you a some sort of salary. Then you do a job and you want to satisfy them. So when you were doing, you know, doing the commercial work and then you're doing your personal work. Yeah. Uh, some some photographers get so caught up in the commercial work that, they're, yeah. that their personal work ends up, you know, on the dustbin or in the closet <laughs> no. somewhere. So uh, how did you resist? Oh, it was never a problem because I didn't want to be. I never had a studio. I would I have an assistant every now and then. I don't know how to use strobe. I would carry, I went to photograph the president of IBM and the art director wrote about it in an article I saw. He said he was embarrassed because I showed up in one hand, I had a little bag with my camera and stuff. In the other hand, I had a bag from the photo store and that was it. No entourage, no seven assistants, no nothing. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm cottage industry. I never wanted to be Avedon. I didn't want that. I didn't want an overhead of, you know, like $30,000 a month or whatever, you know. But look, I could do a job and make $10,000 in one day. Come on. How good is that? And I like what I was doing. I did it for, I've always had fun. I never, I haven't worked in 50 years. I did pamper ads for Christ's sake. Not for Christ's sake, for $10,000 a day. <laughs> Come on, you know, what is that, you know? Were you sort of surprised initially when people were coming up to you considering the kind of work that you were doing, that they were interested in using commercial. you for a commercial? Yeah, and I loved it. I said, I, I, you know, I, my great friend Fred and I were together for 57 years. You know, oh, we, wow. we had long, and he died of uh, Alzheimer's about seven years ago. I'm and, sorry. No, no, four years. No, I am too, but you know what happens. But, um, and though we're gay, we're not typical gay people. I loathe maple Thorpe. He makes me want to. Oh, ick, yuck, yuck, yuck. No, I never liked Maplethorpe. He was, a, for being so professionally gay, he knew nothing about the subject. I mean, really, he knew nothing about it. He, Reverend Falwell would have described gay as what he thought it was, you know, like men dressing up like women, leather. Look at his books. He knew nothing about it. Uh, you want to hear my gay shtick? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, here, here's what it is. Homosexuality is just like heterosexuality, except it's different. Everything in nature is done in abundance and variation. Nature makes 20,000 kinds of butterflies, 20,000 kinds of beetles. And in real life, in the sexual spectrum, na nature makes some guys who are 90% straight, 10% gay, blah, 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 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. It's a variation. Nobody grows up and makes a choice. It's never a choice. You discover you're gay just the way you discover you're straight, except we don't have a backup system. It's much tougher to be gay. No, but if you're true to yourself, you know, you're okay. But tell me how you really feel. Yeah, you want to know? <laughs> I, listen, I'm, I'm the most opinion. I cannot stand people who don't have opinions. I could do 10 minutes on any subject. Do you I think that it. people, on that point then, do you think that a lot of the work that you, you see created by, by people, they're playing it safe? That they don't give yeah. voice to? Yeah. They photograph other people's lives. They photograph women's tits without telling me what they really think about women. And the thing between men and women, my assistant's going through a divorce from hell. I'm so glad I'm not straight. Oh, my God. What a bother. Oh, you can still get married. I was married. Fred and I were married. I don't believe in marriage. We only got married for the legal benefits, you know. When it comes to the fine art world, tell me about negotiating that. I know it was, it's changed a lot in over the last 50, 60 yeah. years, but... Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I was very lucky because I was taken up by, have you ever heard of Sidney Janis? 
No, that was like one. Of the, God, well, my, I say my work is really cut out here. City Janus is one of the best galleries in New York, and really. And I was the first photographer the, for show, or probably for mostly, and it was amazing. But I wasn't into the art. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even like the word art. I hate the word art. You think of Michelangelo. You think of Picasso. Oh no, no, no! You do your stuff, and I hate when students say, "Oh, I do my art on weekends." No, you don't. You take pictures on weekends. The, I, the pretensions of art. I call it fart. F a r t. I mean, anybody who brags about being an artist is nonsense. And don't tell me about your art. No, you do your work. That's all. But yeah, it was very exciting because uh, there was no art. Photography was begging to become an art, you know. And now you have this whole generation of photographers who have jumped ship, like, uh, let's see, who all? Eggleston, uh, Cindy, they're not mm -hmm. photographers, they're artists who use a camera. Oh, please, don't piss on my foot and tell me it's raining. They're photographs. And this whole pretensions of, because if it's a photograph, it's worth 35000 but if it's an art piece, conceptual art piece and if it's really big like Gursky then, then you know it's really art if it's like six feet by six feet you take a, a snapshot of a parking lot in Tokyo and you make it six feet by well it's got to be art how else could it be that big you know what you call it you know do you sometimes feel that people want you to do that they, they want you to define what, what you're it, doing in a different way no the market the art market does I no, whatever I do small prints an eight by ten picture by Robert Frank can be so powerful an eight by 10 photograph of a parking lot in Tokyo by Gursky is just a very large parking lot. It's an advertising picture fit for the size of a building. It's shouting art, art. Ooh, I said the A word. It's, it's whispering. Power for work whispers. It doesn't have to shout. Do you feel that the work that you're, you're making, making now whispers? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I'm doing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I did a piece I sent out this week called "I'm Much Nicer Than God," and I'm talking about intimate things. It's all about intimacy. Intimacy is the deepest communication. Shouting is not communicating. That's a, that's annoying. But when somebody whispers it, it's in subtleties. Picture this: a woman entirely nude can be anatomy. A woman dressed, but she exposes one breast, becomes erotic. It's not the volume mm -hmm. or the size. Oh, well, the size does matter from time to time. They tell me, what do I know? But uh, <laughs> anyway, been there, not done that. But uh, see, I like playing with language. Been there, not done that. Been there, done that. I said, been there, not done that. You know, I never heard that before. In terms of the, the whispering, in terms of the way you yeah. see your work yeah. that you're creating now. Well, the more intimate the work is, the more powerful it is. It really is, you know. I once I was talking to somebody the other day, and I, I showed him a photograph somebody sent me, and it was an erotic picture. It was a snapshot, erotic, you know. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And so I showed it to this friend of mine. And I said, you know what's interesting? Not the photograph, but how the situation when it was taken. Mm -hmm. The guy is, is on his stomach. He's looking back at the camera. He looks uncomfortable. The picture's not, you know, just like a snap. It's a bad picture. What's going on? Is he looking at the viewer with anxiety? Is he embarrassed? Is he hot? What? So, so I said to this friend of mine, well then write about it, write, show the picture and then write about the circumstances of it. I did that with a, there was a upscale, pretentious gay magazine, I think in Australia called Blue and beautifully produced and, you know, pretensions. So they gave me some pages and I said, here's what I want to do. You go through a magazine, you see a picture in the magazine. Mm -hmm. But then I think, well, what was, it? What was the contact sheet? How that happened? So I, I want to do a sequence about the story of how a picture got taken. So you see my doorbell, the guy's ringing the doorbell. He comes in, we sit and chat and I describe to him what I want to do. And we set up and I take pictures of him. Then I have the contact sheet. And we prove, you show the contact sheet. And then you show, I show them the one that I wanted. And then you see the picture that appeared in the magazine. So it's a story of how a photograph wanted to be. I thought, how, I look at a picture, what were the circumstances? How did that happen? You know, was it an accident? It's a very sweet photograph. Was that the intention of it? So, you know, there's lots and lots of wiggle room in talking about photography. It's the same old nonsense, you know. Anyway. What? What, what painters or sculptors do you look at 
that you feel like evoke the very qualities that you try to pursue? Well, in the then world? it's not the same thing. You can't, one size doesn't fit all. But I love De Chirico. I like Magritte. De Chirico is very surreal. They all question reality. Rather than duplicating reality, telling me what I already know, I can enjoy a beautiful still life by Cezanne. That's highly stylized and it has a lot of history, but it's like looking at a photograph of apples. Oh, that's pretty. Oh, look, daisies. Aren't they lovely? Yeah, they're lovely. Mm -hmm. Okay. The sunflowers. Then you get the sunflowers by, what's his name? Oh, I was doing Japanese photographs in fan shape. And I thought, where I lived in the country, I did a lot of nature stuff. And I, I found this beautiful field of uh, sunflowers. So I photographed this guy carrying a ladder in the field and I wrote a text. It said, Van Gogh went into a field of sunflowers, set sunflowers. up a ladder and climbed to heaven. Boom, that was my thinking. Then I photographed a rainstorm and I said, suddenly a summer shower, I am watered like a flower. I don't be regret being wet because I blossom for an hour. You know, I could do, you know, there's no limit. I mean, anything that I do, and I don't work for an audience. I think I like that. I like what I wrote. I think it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, that's in seeing your work and especially in this conversation, it's just that I, 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 the biggest impression that I get is that if you know that you are, that the only audience you need to satisfy is your own, then you're not really limited. You can be no. as honest and as open and as frank and as vulnerable as you want yeah. to be in your work. Yeah. I, you know, but that's what gets, who cares what you do? You know, my mother and father would come to New York and I have a show of all this strange stuff. And let's say to my mother, well, what do you think? And she's, well, that's nice. Now, people don't care about, you'd be surprised who doesn't care about you. Nothing personal. I'm sure a lot of people mm -hmm. like you. I vaguely like you, but a lot of people like you. But who cares? Nobody cares. What's the big danger? Oh, I might make a mistake. Really? You're probably better at mistakes. Do you go with your strength, make mistakes. You'll grow more out of your mistakes. You'll be trapped into your success. So how do you, you know, when you, when you do create a piece of work and it's just not working, how do you, how do you look at it? Do you just? I, no, it always works. I, I, when I do it, my, my track record is really very good. Sometimes it doesn't work, you know, but I, I'm, 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 you know, what's interesting now that I'm an old, old fogey, I've just been doing all this work all this time. I never paid attention to, it. I mean, I never looked at it cause I was doing something else, but now mm -hmm. I look at it and it's really good. That early work I did still stands up. It has shelf life. Really, my work has shelf life. Pictures of uh, political pictures always have, they, they don't have shelf life. They're, you know, pictures of the New Deal are interesting, you know, but they don't travel. They don't have legs. And I just, I'm, I'm doing sculpture too. Look me up, you'll see my sculpture on DC Moore. It's interesting. Yeah, really interesting. So what quality do you, do you see in your work that makes it feel like it's that it's lasted all this time? And when you look at the work, is what are the qualities that you see inherent in that work okay. that makes it makes right. it still significant? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly. I did a picture years ago called this photograph is by proof. And I photographed I was at my grandmother's house and my cousin uh, Kenny came in with his bride and I photographed them on my old bed and you know and it, for me it was a wedding picture and he's sitting there and she's got her arms around his waist and he's in a suit and they're obviously in love and they're both looking at me and he's he's got this Cheshire cat look yummy yummy and mm -hmm. she has I caught him I got him yeah it was lovely and then I wrote underneath it and it said this photograph is that my proof there was that afternoon when things were still good between us and she embraced me and she loved me. Look, something like, look, see for yourself. So, yeah. so late, years later on, they didn't get divorced, but years later on after relationships, people photograph falling in love. They never photograph divorce days. So this photography proves something happened. Yes, it proves I was young. It proves I was in the army sitting next to a tank. You know, it's a wonderful documentary. It's a quality. So I, you know, it's, I just said, look at this picture. That's when they loved each other, when they first got married. Now they don't like, you know, like my mother and father. You know, they don't even talk anymore. And, and that's a simple, a simple observation. But people know what I'm talking about. It's no big deal. It's a fact. 
My my photographs are authentic. They're about real things. It's not about bullshit. And that's what you. That's that's what I. You know, so that's what I think as well. Is it just if it's authentic, it lasts. Yeah, I'm authentic. Yeah. I, this is the real thing. I'm not doing anything for you. I do the same shtick for anybody who asks me. This is oh, what so. I am. Yeah, that's why he don't disappoint. Yeah, whatever. I come across. <laughs> Tell me about it. I still deliver. Yeah, my, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our oh. listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long in- admired or someone yeah, you've recently discovered. Are actually dead. Sarah Moon. Sarah, Sarah Moon. Moon. Do you know her? I know of her, yeah. Oh, she's fantastic. She's fantastic. She's authentic. I love the idea of being authentic. Almost anybody who does... Uh, reportage does a rip uh, uh, their their spin off of the Robert Frank show. You mm-hmm. can't help it. It goes with the territory, you know. This is 2000, what is it, 2020? Damn. Why are you still talking about the same old shit? Talk, what, you know, what, talk about what really makes you angry. Here's what I tell students to do. You go take notes. All right. Here's what you do everybody has a secret, and that's something that you don't even want to admit to yourself. Suppose when you were a kid and you stole the candy bar, you know, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, I I stole the candy bar. Or maybe you cheated on an exam. You looked at Marianne's answers and copied. I don't know, whatever whatever your thing is. All right, write down on a piece of paper one sentence. One, the Chinese say to walk around the world, you've got to take a first step. One honest sentence. I, I, I would write, I didn't like my father. How could you say that? Like, mm. but don't let him. Don't tell your mom. Oh my God, that's a terrible thing. Shame on you, Ben. And I would write it and, and put it under my underwear where nobody would ever look. <laughs> Not even me. <laughs> and then maybe two weeks later, I would take it out. Mm. Nobody has to see it. Nobody has to know about it. I would write a second sentence. I did not. Love, I don't think I love my father, and I don't think he loved me. Oh my God, he, you don't think he loved you? How could you say you're bad boy? But it's true. It's honest. Mm. So I've taken two steps around the world to liberate myself. You know, it's not for anybody. And maybe I have the courage. Maybe, maybe somewhere there's a kid out there who wants to write it on a piece of paper. Ah, oh, I think, I think I'm in love with Jimmy. Oh my God, I, that must be a fact. We can't say that out. Oh my God. Oh no, no, no. And then you, and then you, then two years later you take it out and you write on the second sentence. Yes, I do love Jimmy. Oh, my God. How could you be fucking honest with yourself? And then you'll see where it takes you. I can't tell you what to do. And if you're going to be honest with yourself, then, you know, I don't care what you do. Well, thank you, Dwayne, so much. I really enjoy having a chance to talk with I you. I love being had. <laughs> I don't have like this in Okay, say hello to everybody. Thanks to Dwayne for joining us. Find out more about him and his work by following some of the links that I have on the Candid Frame website. If you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us a review on whatever service you listen to podcasts. Those reviews have allowed us to grow. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our mailing list. On the YouTube channel, I offer critiques on images submitted by TCF listeners like you, while the mailing list is Keeps you updated with all TCF events, including workshops and more. Sign up today. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to Edmundo and Neely Drawn for their recent contributions. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you can't find every episode on the show on whatever app you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at Incompetech. Dot com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.